Welcome to Artists in Residences, the Westport Library's virtual artist series. I'm Carol Erger Fass, exhibit curator at the library. Today, we join Migs Burroughs at the studio of Gay Shem. Gay's worked in a variety of media over her long career, including sculpting with clay, painting, and drawing. She's also a high school art teacher for over 20 years, ran an art and yoga retreat in Italy, and continues to teach art classes in her gorgeous Winstead studio. Her most recent work is done in an ancient technique called encaustic painting. And to be honest, I had to look it up when I heard the word. Here is my boiled down version. The earliest known encaustic paintings were on Egyptian mummies dating back to about 100 AD. The process uses heat to melt beeswax combined with pigment that's applied in many layers with brushes and other tools to achieve the artist's desired effect. Gay has done several encaustic paintings on, in series, both abstract and figurative, and is well known for her series on crows, which have been an obsession of hers for several years. Crows were also the subject of a fascinating book of drawings she made during the pandemic on the daily trials and tribulations of living during lockdown. So now let's join Migs and Gay, and she can give you a closer look at how she makes these wonderful images. Thank you very much, Carol, and thanks to the Westport Library. Uh, we love doing this series. We're in, uh, I don't know how many, 30 or 40 of these, and uh, it's just been a great experience uh, getting an inside look at an artist's process and studio. And we're with Gay Shemp today. And um, why don't we start off by just telling us uh, you're standing in a studio, but where are you and um, and how long have you been there? Uh, well, welcome to my studio. I'm in Winstead, Connecticut. I moved to this studio 16 years ago from Norwalk. Um, and uh, I've enjoyed this huge space. So, but do you work in a lot of media? I know we're gonna get into all the kind of, you're into encaustic, I think we're into a lot of things, but did you work in multiple medias, you know, simultaneously, or do you kind of have a mindset where I'm doing encaustics for the next year and then I'm gonna to switch to watercolors and then I'm gonna, you know. I mostly get led, um... In, me, in terms of media, depending on what my subject is. If I'm painting uh, the lake in the morning, I'm working in oil or watercolor. If I have a series going like a crow, you know, a, a series of crows that I've been working on, mm. um, then I'll be working in encaustic. Um, so I would say the subject dictates the media. And as I said, I work in a wide variety of media. So uh, I'm, working in pastel, watercolor, uh, oil, and encaustic. And of course I draw and write as well. <laughs> and I think that's mostly because I was a public school art teacher and high school art teacher for so many years. I didn't want to give up any of those media I had been practicing. So they all came here up to Winstead with me and I accessed them. Yeah, no, you're, you're so... Um multi-discipline like this is a word i don't know you you are a potter as well all right ceramics and potter uh, yeah. most people well most people from fairfield county uh know me from uh the years of being a potter i was a potter for about 22 years there um and even today i tend every once in a while to go back into three-dimensional uh work and so what we should start off, I guess we're looking at a painting right over your shoulder there. What you want to talk about that for a bit and what, what uh... I first arrived here and uh, that's an oil painting and it's part of an autobiographical series. Um, and this is just talking about my journey from the world of fire. I was a potter and I transitioned, um, gaining new knowledge, married a, my old boyfriend, looking for the pearl of wisdom. Hmm. And I lived place of water right now I live on a lake yeah I noticed on your uh, website which is gay shemp ceramics right no gay, gay shemp's in encaustic.com right and yes. shemp with two p at the ends gay yes. shemp um encaustic.com and yeah there's I love there's a different series 
and, and there's water in a lot of those. There's one just on waves alone. Yes. And uh, over there, I'm going to take you yeah. with me. Okay, please. Yep. There's um, one of the water paintings from that series. That series, um, I was trying to have the viewer feel like they were actually in the water with me. Mm. And I was recording um, what the water felt like that day. Was it a stormy day? Was it a sunny day? You can see the glint on the water from the morning time. Um, I, I would say I probably work on a series two or three years. And then a new idea comes and I shift, maybe shift media. Uh, and I'd like to take you with me mm -hmm. to this. Uh, this is plaster and it has uh, layers and layers and layers of wax on it. These are little shrines. That's, that's from a shrine series that I did. Um, and on this wall, there's just a variety of work. Most of it is encaustic. Encaustic is beeswax with pigment in it. You can polish it up because it's wax. <laughs> Maybe Glenn could get a close up so we can see, get a sense of the texture of it, because it could be from this view, could just be paint, but uh, encaustic. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of dimpled. I mean, there's kind of a. It's a very sexy surface. It's a satiny, smooth surface uh, built up of wax with pigment in it. I'd like to show you how that's done. Yeah, yeah I'd love that. And what and why it may be obvious, it's, it's obvious to you, but not to make most people what, you know, what's the advantage or what does encaustic offer that just oil paints don't? I'm gonna take you over with okay. me. Encaustic's in uh, an ancient media, and um, what does it offer that oil paint and the other media don't? I think it's the the fat. One of the things I really like about it is it's non toxic. So mm. this beeswax. Beeswax is a sealant as well as a preservative, so the colors are locked in. They're sealed in to the surface, which means that they're not going to fade. They're over time. Um, so archivally, it's a great product. Um, I, I already mentioned the fact that it's non-toxic. I don't have to be hmm. so aware of the turpentine or the oh, other yeah. stuff I'm using. And, uh, and you can work in translucent layers like watercolor. You can work opaquely and overfuse it and get abstraction. So it offers um, just a multitude of approaches after eight years of working with it, I'm still ex I'm still exploring. Oh, yeah. hmm. So this is it. I mean, it, the wax just comes as a chunk of beeswax. It's melted in a crock pot. Color is added to it. And I've got some pots of color here ready to go. Really? So that, that's pre-melted, right? I mean, you've melted. Oh, those are the, what kind of pigment? What are the colors with the pigment? Yes, I can use these blocks of color. This is this is now uh, beeswax with pigment and varnish in it. Oh. Pulled these blocks. Oh, then, okay. I, then I can pick them up, melt them on the griddle. Sort of a short order art chef, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> pick it up. Hmm. You can see it cools very, very quickly. So you're painting with wax, essentially. I'm painting with colored wax. Yeah. I'm going to um, layer up on this little corner a little bit so that we can get some trippy effects. Hmm. And each layer that you do has to be fused to the layers underneath. This, this, uh, material and caustic is actually the word means burning in can you see it yes yeah wow look at that Isn't that cool yeah so you and and you can control the the degree of uh change with with how much heat you apply right correct 
let's put a little transparent on here and overlap it a little bit and see what we get. Well, that's, wow, that's really exciting. So you really, it's almost like you're collaborating with the, with the wax. I mean, right, the wax is giving, you're, you're telling, doing stuff to the wax and the wax is giving wax it back. Is giving it back. Um, I think, you know, you, you asked me before, what's, what's the attraction over the other media? I think one of the things is the fact that accident is such a big part of this. Mm -hmm. And having so long in clay um, with firing, it's natural for me to be attracted to something where I don't have total control. Yeah, that's interesting because, uh, you know, it's so counterintuitive to what most artists would think of they want complete control, you know, I want a, a brush for every kind of line and every kind of stroke and fill and. Well, there are, um, you know, I, over the years have learned uh, I have to get a little more control with this. I can use a smaller brush and put smaller strokes, yeah, I see. strokes as I go and therefore get a graphic image. So and, oh, okay. And I do like narrative work. Um, I do, I work in abstraction, but I'm a storyteller basically. So um, I had to find these ways that I could incorporate a, a graphic image in this beautiful um, accident of encaustic. And um, I've learned that I can take my sketches and transfer them. Mm -hmm. uh, you special kind of pencil or ink, I can transfer them into the surface so I can get drawings in there. Um, and I can just pick up and paint with a smaller brush, stroke by stroke, um, doing, you know, fusing each stroke as it goes. I can also, because it's wax, whoops, because it's wax, I can carve hmm. back into it. Oh, oh, that's great. Oh, that's a I love that. Wow. So, so yeah, so it can be very figurative as well. It's not just pure abstraction, but the background takes on this really kind of ethereal quality. I can also, can you get a close up of this? Yeah, just hold it up to the- I can yeah. also layer images between layers of wax. Oh. As I feel it, it's a preservative, so mm -hmm. if if it's organic material, there's maybe 10 layers on, of wax on this piece, each layer with some images and then clear, transparent, more images. And the images are applied. Now those look almost photographic. So how are they, or is that painted? Um, this, was a, this was a photograph that I then photocopied and transferred. Oh. That's, that's an etching that I did, that I took a shot of and then transferred. Okay. So and there's just, little pieces of paper in here, underneath here too. Hmm. So you can put organic material in between the layers as well. Yeah, one of your quotes would just direct, you know, on your website, it says that acoustic is about trapping fragments of color, message, and memory in time. There so that's you go. What, that's what you're doing. So that's, that's actually, you can see physically that's what's yeah. happening. Yeah. Yeah, and and the um, which I guess leads to the crows, or unless you would want to go off and another come back to the crows later. But what's the, the the crows? Well, I have a question in between. You seem to be attracted. I mean, potting, uh, uh, being a potter and a ceramicist involves intense heat. This encaustic involves heat. Is there, you know, did you uh, was your father a fireman or something? <laughs> when did you grow up around fire or heat? <laughs> No, I don't know uh, what that that's about, but um, we heat our house with a wood stove. Oh, too. you do? Okay. Oh, so I guess there is <laughs> thing about fire that I love. Well, it's very primal. Mm. This is uh, this is the latest series that I've been working on. Um, a murder of crows flew into our yard, and there were maybe 20, 25 of them maybe more, hmm. and kept them there by um, taking broken pieces of jewelry or shiny stuff that I found 
and I'd throw it out there and they'd come and collect it. And then they settled in the grove and eventually allowed me to be right amongst them, photographing them, sitting and sketching them. Mm. And this is the gift they gave me. These are all uh, images that come from quirky yeah. gestures that I, uh, that I saw. No, I love the series. Yeah, they're, look at, they're so, I mean, crows happen to be, they've done studies and obviously, as you know, you know, that one of the few birds, if not the only that use tools that know how to use tools, like they will hold a straw and poke into a, a hole to get something or a tree, you know, yep. and they, their eyes, they, they just look so intense and in, in self-aware almost. They almost, I almost felt like they were communicating with trying to communicate with me at times because of their mm. um, friendliness. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, they're portrayed, you know, in movies, you know, Alfred Hitchcock and other movies is very malevolent. I mean, yeah. they're not, and they look, you know, they're black and there's, there's sort of, uh, I, I think there's a famous, I think Orson Welles, one of his movies, he used a crow screaming in a quick little interlude. And they asked him why he did that. He said, just to get your attention. Like there was no, it was just this great symbolism of kind of evil. And there's always, yeah, you know, but you don't think that, they're, you don't see them as evil. That whole symbolism comes to us um, all the way from the 1400s. Oh. And uh, you've heard of the plague doctor. Right, play, mm -hmm. play from the from the um, 17th century. Well, I had been doing this crow series, and I was like, I want to get off crows. <laughs> I want I'm ready for a new thing. I, <laughs> oh, parakeets. <laughs> so I went back to sculpture mm -hmm. and make art about whatever's happening in my life at that time. Mm -hmm. We're in this horrible pandemic, and. So I said, well, I'm going to reach back and for that, that mask that the plague doctor wore and do a contemporary images on this, this potent symbol for malevolence, death, destruction. Yeah. And so I started sculpting these masks. I got about six of them done. I'm like, damn, you're doing crows again. <laughs> <laughs> So this this is uh this is all writing journal writing behind here, and of course there's this death symbol of our toll on America. Oh yeah, or just counting the days till when this ends. What so what is that made out of? How did you sculpt? How was that made? Um, this is a, a material that's a haberdashery material. Uh, it looks like felt, but mm -hmm. when you drape it over a form and steam it, it will hold its shape. So I created a form and then put that material on, steamed it, then put plaster over that, more plaster over that, and then um, sealed it and then started my painting. And is that form to your face? Do you want to, without messing up your hair, can you put that over your face? No, I didn't do that. I was sculpting, but I wasn't really thinking. I was thinking of an object. I wasn't. Oh, so do, well, no, it, it, oh, that's, pretty, that's pretty good. Wow. <laughs> so I mean, again, you know, we're, crows obviously are very smart, and they're but why are they called a murder of how, how many crows does it take to be a murder of crows? I mean, two is two a murder or how, oh, how many? For ten. Ten. I think it's. Uh, yeah. I think I have okay. to look. Now on that crow thing, uh, when the studio was this this building, my beautiful building. Uh, was closed during the quarantine, uh, was closed for about a month. And then the second month, they kept it closed because they're doing all the floors. And then I had a hip problem and I couldn't stand that long. So what I ended up doing is I had just paper and pen at home. I started mm -hmm. whatever was happening that day. But I said, well, I'm going to use the persona of a crow. Mm -hmm. So I created this book I didn't start off to make a book but um there's oh yeah slow down a bit so you can just take a little look at the okay oh that's wild so this crow's just in and empty shelves mm. empty 
ourselves. We I didn't get into that, but my kids did. The Tiger King thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And wow, what a what, great that every time I coughed, my Was husband that a crow holding a thermometer. Yeah. Holding a thermometer. Every time I coughed, he'd say, Take your temperature. Remember <laughs> the spring? Oh yeah. <laughs> And like grocery stores, there were people with these dreadful uh, gloves. People would leave them. Yeah. Yeah. So we're can people, that's a wonderful, wow. Here's, so this was done over what period of time? Yeah. So this records 2020 and it's daily, it's every day. So. Oh. So that, oh. Here's a meltdown. Uh, can you see it? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Where can people get the get the book? How can they, they can get the book right from uh, right from my website, mm -hmm. uh, get And she published it. That is self published. So, so. no, it's yeah. fantastic. I mean, the, the, I think you've given the crows. You know, you've become a. I guess you, they're not done with me yet. That's the only. <laughs> threat. I'm like ready to move on, but everything I that. Well, they're mysterious. There's so much, you know, again, symbolism and iconography about crows and the, 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 the you know, again, they're intelligent, but they're Absolutely. always portrayed as evil and, or, the, or uh, when you see a crow, it means death is coming and all that kind of thing. Well, but, it means that to some cultures in every yeah. culture, the crow symbol is a symbol for change. Okay. So. Yeah, well. For transition, I mean, death is just a transition, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you um, want to take the light. Well, I was start starting to talk about the 1400s. Yeah. Uh, itinerant, you wouldn't, he wasn't really a doctor. I guess today we'd call him an undertaker. This itinerant, always male, um, undertaker hmm. would go <laughs> town administering to the dying and taking care of the dead. Um, and he would be identified because he wore that mask, the plague doctor's mask. He had a hat and covered over this way and then a long trench coat and gloves and boots and all waxed in black. So at that time, the, the, in that culture, they thought the crow was a symbol of death. So when they saw this black crow coming into town, they knew who he was and he needed to be directed. Kind of interesting, I think. Yeah, it is. No, and you've just Im embedded them with so much, uh, I don't know, interest and, and uh, mystery, which is, which I, you know, you don't know, you can look in their eyes and go, is that, does, does, do they know that I'm looking at them? Do they see me? Do they, what are they thinking? You know? They do look, they look really yeah. intense. <laughs> what's the eye and you've you know every time you know your pictures is that it's usually a side eye giving you the side eye which is you know yes, stink I eye or whatever of, you know. i do a lot of images with them giving you that that um that like who are you yeah yeah that inquisitive kind of yeah um well there's other um there's so much to to talk about but you're i I knew you, well, I don't know if we can, I may bring up a picture of it if I can find it after, after we finish this, but uh, when you, you were doing um, tours to Europe, right? Yoga, art yoga tours, right? I was doing um, tours to Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, I had done a tour to Japan and I had done a tour to Greece. Uh, these are, this was for artists and collectors. And then uh, the tours to Italy with Joy Abrams, who was a yoga teacher, um, we just got love letters all year from that. That was a week gig in Tuscany in a gorgeous villa, beautiful setting, um, doing yoga in the morning and then an art lesson, then your big pranza, your big, your big lunch, and then, um, some relaxation. And then we spend the afternoon painting, uh, in the nearby hillsides or around the grounds of the villa yoga at night. Beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, you couldn't do that during COVID, but is any any thought to continuing that either on your own or with with? No, I have a new idea. My new idea is art and cooking. Oh, wow. Yeah, about that. 
So I would, um, I would make, uh, create a book, a bound book that each participant would get. And in that book would be papers for watercolor, for collage, a map of the area, a little bit about where we're staying and um, all the recipes that we would be practicing so that uh, me, for my part would be um, illustrations. So we would illustrate our time together there, either with landscape painting or the preparation of the food or whatever seemed to come to us at the time. So you come home with your own illustrated cookbook. Oh, great. I think great idea. Yeah. So you're gonna think you're gonna do it? You're, uh, I I mean, can't do it now, but you know. Yeah, I can't do it now. And I would really need to team up with a cooking school and mm. get a little help with the land package. Um, I used to do all that stuff myself and time to delegate. Right, yeah. Yeah, and you've got a lot going on. It, also on your website, there's another one of your series was, was uh, and I don't know what this word is, is it coin, K-O-I-N-E, what is that? Yeah. It says uh, Japanese, it looks like kanji or something. Yeah. That series was based on um, my interest in ancient languages and also surrealism. So um, I was using the surrealist trick of not looking at the paper and just going into a meditative state and just waiting till your hand moves. Mm. And those, those would be the, uh, the mark making that would happen uh, on these panels. I was also investigating with using maybe 15 to 30 layers of wax. So very, very um, thick. Mm textural i could scratch into it i could embed it things in it and um i wanted these things to look like ancient panels that were dug up from somewhere and we don't understand the language mm. so those marks which i again look almost like you know japanese brush strokes or something were your invented gestures right correct yes yeah well they did yeah they took on a a look of kind of ancient whatever wisdom or something you know I couldn't tell so I asked and then there's an immigration series is is that relative to was that done our current situation although that's been going on for years but uh the immigration series started with um my concern about use, losing the big herds of elephants and other herds due to poaching and um water shortage and so forth and then um, as time went on, I became taking you with me. Oh, there we go, yeah. Can you get this one, Glenn? As time went on, I mm. became aware more of human migration mm -hmm. and started working with that subject. Um, and then that led me, can you get maybe that one? Oh yeah, this lone figure, if it's a, an animal. Yeah. Going, going off in the distance. Yeah. Was that inspired? Did you went to Africa? I did not. <laughs> That's oh, okay. my it's a wish. It's a wish. Yeah. Um that there's one of those coin pieces up there. I don't know if Glenn could show you that. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah definitely. Uh, during working on this uh series, there's another one down here, Glenn right over here. Working on uh, this migration series got really, really tough towards the end because it's a dreadful subject when you turn mm. to human migration due to oppression or, uh, or war or famine or whatever. Right. And um, when the situation happened on our border with kids in cages, I said, that's it for that series. I need to do something else. This is I'm coming into the studio and depressing myself. Mm. So, uh, how do you make something beautiful out of a subject like that? I need a new, I need something new. And the next day the crows came. Oh, oh I'll see. They, they know they were watching, they're paying attention. I can't help but notice just behind you, there's a little bat. Is that Janine Brown's little wire basket behind you? Oh. That's Janine, gave it to me as a gift. Yeah, Janine, did you do her little 
I got one is when I she did this series I, on I am. Did you do that? I did. Oh, okay. Because yeah, I got one of those as a as a thank you for doing that. I look familiar. But you were talking about cages, and it's just kind of a mini cage in a way, but it's also oh, yeah. a ball. Uh, I guess it's the way a cage is oriented. This way it's a cage, that way it's a bowl, you know. Um so what, you've got a lot of artifacts on your walls. Like you, you didn't go to Africa, but I see these are those ox skulls, you know, they it looks like um um I teach drawing and these are uh some of the props and things that I use. Uh my daughter lives in New Mexico. My mother used to go to Arizona all the time. So mm. uh, carried on my lap home. Well, not the Ivix. I mean, that that was a gift. But um, these these drawings. So you use them for still life uh, subjects? Life and, and um, teaching drawing. Mm -hmm. It's a it's just a a winning drawing almost every time. Yeah. yeah. It's an interesting subject. It's not a difficult subject. And um, the white skull allows me to um, get light on it so that people can really see the, to model a form. Yeah, and that's interesting. Yeah, my father was an illustrator and his whole, I mean, he tried to simplify everything to the utmost degree and his was just, art is all about light and shadow that's all there is you know which is very oversimplification but true you know true. um you know a long time ago i taught continuing ed and it was only for a couple of weeks i was exhausted i'd come home every day and it's like i just wanted to go to bed it was mentally and and i had such re renewed admiration for teachers that do that day in and day out and you must love it i mean i i liked it because I it was love it. I love, um, I especially love the way I teach now because um, it's, I don't have to grade. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to, you know, do that. And um, my students mostly right now, my group classes have been with me for a couple of years. So to see somebody grow from not having any ability at all to mm. doing portraiture even. Wow. And Getting it, getting it is, it's marvelous. It's, it energizes me. So no, I had the opposite reaction. I don't think I get wiped out from it. I think I get um, new ideas for my own work. Sometimes I have to research something uh, for a student. Maybe it's about a color or color interactions. So that, that also juices me to go mm. through that. No, I love it. Yeah, well, obviously I didn't have the, <laughs> I wasn't cut out to be a teacher or thing. I mean, I I did enjoy the interaction and and, and watching what students came up with. But uh, well, thank you so much, and thanks to Glenn for being such a good camera person and um, and surviving our setup process. But uh, this was wonderful, Gay. Thank you so much. Oh, we're done. Yes, if you want to be. Yeah. Thanks, Migs, and thanks, Gay, for that fabulous demonstration. To see more of our artists in residences videos, go to the video and podcast gallery on the library's website, westportlibrary.org. Thanks, and hope to see you at the library soon. <laughs>